In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Good morning to you all, or whatever time of day it is when you're tuning in to watch our video worship for this Reformation Sunday. Welcome everyone to worship. I thought I would uh, come into church this weekend and put on my robe and my nice red stole, your nice red stole that I get to wear, actually, and to uh, lead worship from behind the altar, and I'm going to preach to you from my familiar pulpit for Reformation Sunday. I thought all you folks in uh, the video world out there would enjoy seeing church as it's set up for those who are coming to worship in person um, over these past few weeks. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Almighty God, gracious Lord, we thank you that your Holy Spirit renews the church in every age. Pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us steadfast in your word. Protect and comfort us in times of trial. Defend us against all enemies of the gospel and bestow on your church the saving peace which you have won through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. He lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the eighth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, we are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? 
Jesus answered them, very truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, for you are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, hello again, everyone. It's nice to be back in my pulpit for a change to bring you a Reformation sermon on Reformation Sunday, the Sunday when we remember the beginnings of the renewal of the church that goes by the general name, the Protestant Reformation. That, of course, encompassed many things, but it was, is thought by most scholars to have begun with Martin Luther's posting of the controversial 95 Theses on the Practice of Indulgences way back in 1517. So we're 503 years past that reforming moment. Of course, there have been many other reformations uh, between then and now, as there were many other reforming moments in the church before the Lutheran Reformation of 1517 and following. What I'd like to reflect on today is the particular power of the Reformation in relation to the gospel reading and to our lives, um, to one of the central ideas of the Lutheran Reformation, which Luther believed would re reform the church in every age. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, for you are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, it doesn't happen every week, but certainly over the years there have been profound moments in my ministry that I have been invited into, as a friend or a parishioner has said something like this, Pastor Steve, I really need to talk to you about something important. And it turns out that they have a confession to make. It turns out that one big thing or maybe a whole lifetime of small things or some ongoing thing has surrounded them with a fence of guilt or responsibility or confusion. It's something they can't think themselves, they can't think their way out of by themselves. It's something they can't just talk about with a therapist. It boils down to this. It turns out they've come to a point in life at which they need to hear a word they can't speak to themselves. I was in the same boat myself at some point. Well, at many points, actually, but at some important point. I had not been raised in the Catholic tradition where you just go over to church on Friday at the appointed time and wait in line and tell the priest behind a curtain all about it just as easily as you tell your mom what you did in school today. So I know it took me a while to figure out what I was supposed to do with this one big thing. But at some point in my ministry, I went on a retreat and part of the agenda was personal confession and forgiveness and the time arrived when that opportunity was offered to anyone who needed it or wanted it. And without having thought about it very much beforehand, it just seemed obvious that it was the right thing to do. The group in the retreat was small enough and I just spilled the beans and I got it off my chest. And honestly, if I hadn't done it then, I don't know what kind of pastor I would have or could have ever been. A pretty hypocritical one, I guess, for one thing. Probably not ready to understand what my friends and parishioners were asking for over all these years when they really needed to talk about something. And maybe not really ready to understand what I was supposed to be offering them, namely, the truth. The truth. If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. What is this truth of which Jesus speaks to his disciples? And we hear about it in the eighth chapter of John. It is certainly not my version of something like an advice, a bit of advice or therapy. And it's not my opinion about something 
with God's name attached to it somehow. I think we're often tempted to do that, aren't we? To attach God's authority to our opinions, our hang-ups, our ambitions, our illusions, our insecurities. This is one form of vanity, using the Lord's name in vain. Using God's name to say something that God does not give us authority to say. We have a problem with that. The things we want to be true, we want them to be true so badly that we attach God's name to them. But the truth that Jesus speaks up here is the truth that peeks out from behind the great light and the great darkness that is God to us, that God is and can be for us. It is the truth of God's word about us heard in Jesus' word that comes to us as we, we remember his command to proclaim the forgiveness of sins to one another in his name. And as we understand his death and resurrection to be God's living word that proclaims to us not what we should do, but what God has done for us. In so many ways, Jesus said to those who followed him, those who came out to hear him, you're not simply the sum of your mistakes. You're not defined by the one great thing you may have screwed up. Your life is not somehow more powerful than God's desire and ability to forgive you. In Jesus, you have been given the freedom and the grace to live on, to see yourself and your neighbor more clearly and truly than ever as God's beloved children. That's the truth, Jesus said, that will make us free. That's the law that Jeremiah, the prophet, was preaching about so long ago to God's people Israel who had been taken away into exile as prisoners. And they understood that word to, or that experience of exile to be God's punishment for turning away from that promise, which had brought them out of slavery into the freedom of their promised land into the freedom of being given God's law and offer the chance to live by it as God's redeemed people. That's the truth that Isaiah said when he preached, I will do it over. God said, I will make a new covenant with them. Not like the old one that they broke, says the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and they will be my people and I will be their God. And they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquities and punish their sins no more. Trying to understand that passage about the law that God will put within us and write it upon our hearts, that might be hard and kind of mysterious because it seems like it hasn't fully happened yet. So many people still, still seem unaware that this law has been written on our hearts, unaware that we are given the gift of life brought into this world to have a chance to love God and our neighbor as ourselves, that that's what we're here for. I thought it might help to compare two famous disciples to think about this a little bit. Think about Peter and Judas. We might call them the highest and the lowest of the disciples in terms of how disciples are ranked. Peter, of course, becomes the leader of the disciples and in Christian tradition becomes uh, the leader of the church. Judas, of course, becomes the betrayer of Jesus and kills himself. Certainly they were disciples who had very different experiences of what God was up to and what they should be doing in response. After Peter denied Jesus three times and then abandoned him to the authorities and his crucifixion and death, Peter experienced the joy of Easter. After Judas had betrayed Jesus to the authorities, perhaps hoping to force Jesus' hand and begin his messianic re revolution, his own reformation, he bought a field, tripped and fell, and his guts burst open upon the rock there. And he bled to death alone in a field, knowing only that he was a sinner with nothing else to think except that God would reject him finally and forever. But in her book, Accidental Saints, the Lutheran pastor Nadia Boltz Weber asks a question. How is it that Judas, who betrayed Jesus once and was filled with remorse, became the villain, while Peter, who denied Jesus three times and wept bitterly, becomes the hero, the rock, on which the church is built. 
When it comes down to it, what is the difference really between Peter and Judas? From one point of view, not much at all. Maybe there's not a whole di- lot of difference between either of them and all of us. But this difference there is. The difference is that we share something with Peter that Judas never got to experience. And it's the thing that could have made all the difference. In his isolation, he never received the means of grace. Judas carried with him into that field of blood the burden of not experiencing God's grace because he was removed from the community in which he could hear it. He had left it behind in his guilt and shame. Given what had happened to Jesus, that's understandable. But in his ears, there was never placed a word of grace, at least that we know of. And let me tell you, that's not something the sinner can create for him or herself. As anybody knows who has done something they know deeply in their heart is wrong, that law written upon our hearts tells us when we have done wrong, and we can try to carry it around and pretend it never happened. But we can't create the word for ourselves. It is next to, next to impossible in isolation, in loneliness, to manufacture the beautiful, radical grace that flows from the heart of God to God's blessed and broken humanity, to these creatures made in his image. Long ago, as the Reformation was beginning, Martin Luther said, we must be little preachers for one another. Each of us, not just the bishop, or the pastor or the priest, but each of us has the authority to speak this truth, the gospel that defies the darkness of living as broken ones in a broken world by pointing to the light of Christ. So this Reformation Sunday, brothers and sisters, we begin the 504th year since Martin Luther made that journey of reform that turned into a controversy, that turned into a dispute, that turned into a war that split the church and divided countries and for which large numbers of God's children died on all sides. What was at stake in all of that, at least what was supposed to be at stake, was recognizing two simple things. The first was remembering what the gospel is, that it's not a law or a requirement or some kind of special doctrine, or a hoop to jump through, or a commandment to obey. But it is to remember that the gospel is a promise. This truth will make you free. Jesus' love for all is God's own love for you. That's recognizing what the gospel is. That's the first thing that the Lutheran Reformation was all about. The second is recognizing how it works, this gospel. We say it to each other. We do. We say it with words and deeds, in honest conversations or formal confessions, in the art and music of the church, in the beautiful buildings we build and fill with our voices when we are able to do so again. We speak the words of forgiveness and gospel truth. And as our hearts obey the law that God writes there, when we hear that truth, our hearts open to one another in the truth that each of us is in some way lovable to God. That's the only reformation, really, that the church ever needs. To remember that we are free to get off our high horses and stop taking the Lord's name in vain, attaching God to all of our favorite projects, by making the gospel about our hangups and our traditions and our insecurities, and instead by practicing and saying again, the only thing Jesus gave us authority to say anyway. That is the truth that sets free. That is to announce the forgiveness of sins, to live and to preach the hope of the body's resurrection after death, to trust in the life and love of God everlasting. May you feel free and made free in hearing it again this Reformation Sunday. Amen.
Now let us pray for all the people of God in Christ Jesus, for the church, the world, and each one according to their needs. Reform us, O Lord, by Jesus' example and teaching. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Renew us, O Heavenly Father, with the gifts of your Holy Spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Remind us, O holy God, of your presence in our lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Repair us, O Savior, with your healing and grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Reveal yourself, O Christ, in your word and sacraments and in our fellowship of faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Remember with all your gifts of grace and peace those for whom we pray this week, for all the victims of war and violence around the world, for the victims of natural disasters. Especially we pray for the people of the village of Kumba in Cameroon, where villagers and children were massacred at school this week. Bless Ivine and her family who are safe but very worried and in danger. We pray those who are in hospitals or hospice care this week. We lift up our former pastor Walt and his wife Allison Carlson. For Barry Gensler, Joyce and Lou Loiseau, Augusta Maidenford and Charlie Stoy, and for all who have asked for our prayers, we offer them now. For Joel's family, the loss of his grandmother, and for all who mourn, for all those whom we name before you now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now let us gather all our prayers to God and pray together in the words that Jesus taught us to say. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. 
Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Wherever you are, wherever our worship video finds you this week, may you find and know ways to be at peace with God and one another and to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. See you next week, everyone. For all saints worship, same time, same place, same video channel. See you then. Meantime, God bless you in this week to come. Peace.